Thanks, Andrew. Well, thanks for joining us tonight. I, I know this is a difficult time, so I thought it might be nice to just have a, a chat with everyone and kind of give some perspective. So that, that's actually what I wanted to do over the next uh, hour or so is to acknowledge where we're at, to provide some perspective, um, some confidence, because I've been here before uh, through difficult times. Um, this is actually my seventh time through a really rough cycle in, in my uh, in my time of investing, six through my professional career, um, and also share some opportunities and, and what I see coming forward. Um, a lot, of, a lot of people are wondering, you know, what's what's what happened. I mean, we what was supposed to happen and what's happened. So I'd like to talk a little bit about about that today too. Uh, most people had projections of five or six or seven percent in their long-term goals. You know, they were going to retire or they had expectations that things would grow on some type of a steady keel over the next decade or two. And, uh, and that basically went off, you know, the tracks for a, a while. And, and that does happen from time to time. So we've taken a 34% uh, turn uh, in the wrong direction. And what does that mean, you know, to portfolios? And have we been here before is a question I've heard so much in the last month. Uh, and I'm going to explain some issues or situations where we have been here before. There's been actually three cases over the last hundred years of situations that are very similar. And we'll get through this one. I think actually in better shape than probably the other ones when, when we really get through it. Um, probably with uh, a lot more life being saved, maybe not economically uh, as well and as quickly, but um, life seems to be a lot more important. So I just want to start with acknowledging, you know, the, the loss of life and the hardship that so many of us are going through. Um, I've got friends that have been called off to the front lines in New York and different hot spots around the country. They volunteered or um, signed up to, uh, to help those communities. So, you know, the doctors and the nurses are really the ones we're all, you know, hiding out for and, and, and doing this for, uh, to give them time to, to, to heal the ones that are sick, right? So that is, that is different. Um, we can uh, do things differently than we've done in the past, where before we didn't have the science, we didn't have the technology, the means to help more people. So that's really great even though there's gonna be a tremendous loss of life and there's nothing probably we can do uh, about that, but we're doing everything we can to preserve it. So some perspective, um, what do I mean by we've been here before? So there's been three instances in the last hundred years where we've had pandemics or epidemics that have been significant during financial downturns. Uh, it started, uh, the, the one that goes back that's in most people's minds is the Spanish flu in 1918, um, there was over 700,000 Americans that died. So put that into perspective. I, I don't know if the number is over 7,000 or 10,000 now in the United States, but that's 700,000. So quite, quite a dramatic uh, event in American history and tens of millions died around the world during the Spanish flu pandemic. And I don't know how these terms get labeled Spanish flu. I guess it's this, the Spanish got hit pretty hard there's been some historians that say it started in Kansas. So uh, I'm just using what is in our history books. So, you know, don't take it the wrong way. Um, but financially, what you want to know is well, what happened to the stock market? What happened to the economy? And we did go into a horrible recession. Markets fell in excess of 40%. And remember, this time we've already fallen 34%. Most things are measured from the top to the bottom. And that bottom was measured a couple weeks ago, at least to this point. You know, we don't know if a new low would be made. But I'll explain where I think we're at in that cycle as well in a minute. The Asian flu, if we jump ahead to 1957, um, I, I see uh, reports that 70 to 200,000 um, uh, um, Americans died and millions around the world also correlated with the recession and a 35% drop in stock prices. Sounds familiar. Uh, if we move ahead to the 1982 AIDS epidemic, um, which really took us um, for a scare and it, it had a terrible recession. Um, markets fell 35%, million, uh, hundreds of thousands of Americans died. We finally came up with a cure, but at the time that was some scary stuff. And if, if we look at the, the periods after those events, the 20s, the 1920s, the 80s, 
and even the 60s, they were all amazing decades for stocks. So once we got through those periods, stocks were off to a roll. I, I don't know if that's going to happen this time. I don't think anyone's smart enough to know. Um, prices definitely aren't cheap in, in stock valuations like they were at those other times. So that might be one thing that's uh, kind of the wind in our face and not, not pushing um, maybe markets as high or uh, as much higher as they did like in the 1920s. But I'll tell you, there's been many other really difficult periods through history. Um, I mean, just imagine some of the banking crises that this, this country's had and, and the stock uh, market falling the way it has. Um, we've had uh, Hitler basically take over uh, Western Europe and, 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 and sack France, dropping bombs on London. Um, for many months, uh, if not longer, and, and the market fell only 50%, so just a little bit more than this recent drop. And that, that was really horrible if you put that in perspective to what's going on today. Um, we've had uh, uh, consumer price um, and goods shortages throughout our, our history. We've had uh, Sputnik, where the Russians were ahead in, in the uh, spa space um, war scheme and, and winning that front. Uh, we've had the Bay of Pigs when the world almost came to an end. I mean, we've had some difficult times, uh, hyperinflation in the 70s, 9-11, um, the tech bubble and bust and the financial crisis, which many of you are aware of. So we've been through many difficult times, and, and I know that uh, we'll get through this one as well. So now some confidence. Um, I was on a live call a week ago with a Navy SEAL uh, who discussed an, an interesting topic. Uh, his topic was how to be prepared for uh, battlefield uh, decision making. And he said, if you have 75% of the information, you've probably missed the opportunity. But if you only have 40% or less, you may not have enough information and you may not be successful. So the, the sweet spot somewhere in there, the 45 to 70% of the data, the information, what I look for is similarities in, in market drops and economic um, events. And what I saw three weeks ago, um, I think it was uh, March 16th, when the market finally came to a bottom. And we just went through five weeks where the market didn't have two up days in a row, which I, I wanted to see that stop before I really put the new money to work and started to rebalance portfolios. Uh, gave me a sense that maybe I didn't have to try to grab the, the falling knife, um, which is a way to think about buying stocks on the way down because a lot of times you just really get cut and hurt badly. So I finally saw the capitulation event, which is a, a term that people in our business use is when, well, it's similar what, how you'd re, uh, compare this is when you saw the toilet paper um, missing in the, in the grocery stores, everyone panicked. Okay. So that's what we look for in the stock market or in, um, uh, uh, commercial paper industry when things in the system just aren't working like they should. And uh, when money market funds are very short duration funds that should be always at par are going under par by a percent or two, uh, very rare occurrences in, in history. So we saw this happen a few days uh, before March 16th. And then finally we saw a, a turn of events. So when the capitulation event occurs, you see the, the crazy um, uh, type of uh, situation. And then it seems to wash out. Um, the government came in and said, we're gonna uh, plug all the holes in the commercial paper industry by providing uh, hundreds of billions of dollars of supply so we can buy the bonds and fill the holes so that the money markets and the, and the banks and, and the system works again. And then they come out and you know they were cutting rates already, but they cut rates further took basically interest rates to zero, so made other investments look more attractive. Uh, they've also, Congress has come up with a, a huge stimulus package in the trillions, which we'll talk about a little bit. And those are the types of things that kind of um, turn you from the depression scenario of the early 1930s. When you see these things come into play, especially so quickly, th this has never been done at this type of speed. I mean, in 2008, we had to wait months for these types of things to happen, if not, half a year um, for Congress to get their act together and um, for interest rates to get to this low. Um, and the, the commercial paper industry got plugged pretty quick because that doesn't work. It gets ugly quick. So this is um, all good 
good news uh, when you see the Fed and, and Congress providing this type of uh, uh, liquidity and stimulus. So that gave me a, a good sense that we had hit um, what most technicians look for in a market down cycle. I call it phase one. There's many phases to a cycle. Usually when phase one ends, uh, you have phase two, which can go on for about two to five months. If you look through all of the last 12 uh, recessions in US history, that's been you know 95% of the time, that's the period that stocks will trade sideways in before they start to work out of that phase two uh, scenario. We'll see if that happens this time. That's been what's normal, especially when the Fed comes to the rescue and, and plugs all the holes. So the opportunity um, would be that, you know, return expectations on stocks versus uh, bonds and other types of investments provide a really good risk premium here. And that's why you saw stocks basically go up about 22% since March 16th. So we've already recovered about half of the, the losses. Um, I was, I was looking uh, for a, a guide. You know, if you lose 50% of your money, you need to have 100% just to get back to even. You know, you don't, you don't just get 50% you're back to even. You have to get 100 to get back to where you started. And some people have asked, you know, how long is that going to take? Well, I don't, I don't really know. But I do know we have to get about 40, almost 50% almost, uh, before we're back to where we started this year. Because a 34% drop is going to take about 50% just to get back where we started. So we just got 22 already. So we're almost halfway back to where uh, we started from. So <clears throat> we're seeing um, a really nice spread in the earnings yield of the S&P 500. If you look out over what expectations there are in earnings from corporations versus uh, other investments that you can use your, your money for, like uh, short-term treasury or even long-term treasury, which have gone down to uh, um, you know, 40, 50 basis points. So you're only getting paid half a percent, for example, to tie your money up with the US government for 10 years. And that actually isn't the worst thing. I'll, I'll share some more. If you are a German citizen and you lend the German government money for 10 years, your yield is negative 0.7, or it was recently. That means that you're guaranteed to lose seven tenths of 1% for the next 10 years. So you can have the fortunate return of your capital you started with, but you have guaranteed a loss each year of almost 1% a year. Now you might think, well, why wouldn't I just bury it in the backyard or put it in my mattress? Well, if you're a large pension fund or a, um, an institution that needs to keep a certain amount of money for different periods of time and you've got a billion dollars, you're not gonna put that in your mattress. So you don't have a lot of other options. Um, you can go out in the risk uh, scale and, and invest in different types of bonds with corporations or municipalities or stocks, you know, and take different levels of risk. But you, you saw what can happen to stocks in the short run as well. So maybe a negative 0.7 isn't, isn't so bad. But the, the reason I point out where conservative returns are is that there's a wide differential between um, what conservative investments will pay and what risky ones will pay now. Almost one of the widest in history. It just kind of blew out because of the big drop in uh, prices in, in markets. Um, we, we've only had maybe 5% of the last 40 years where the risk premium or the return for taking this risk has been this great. So stocks have looked good for the last couple of weeks and that's why they're up 20%. Another reason why they've, they've regained so much um, uh, upward momentum is that we just came to a quarter end and a lot of pensions around the country uh, do rebalancing. Rebalancing is when uh, a certain asset class has fallen out of favor temporarily and the portfolio managers or the team believe that a certain percentage of the money that they're managing needs to be in a certain asset class. Well, stocks used to represent 50% of the portfolio. They just fell 30%. So there's a big differential. They've, they've lost a lot of ground and they need to be replaced. So basically, I heard one um, manager this week tell me that $2.2 trillion of money needed to be reinfused to make all the pensions back to their normal balance. That's a lot of buying power. That's what um, had to go on over the last week and, and probably still will for a while now. So that might be one of the reasons why people are asking, what, why is the stock market going up so fast with all this bad news? People are, more people are dying every day. Uh, the stock market's a discounting model. It's already looked out and factored in the worst case scenario for the next six 
to nine months. So it already knows all that stuff's gonna happen. That's what it does. It looks out and, 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 and pretty much uh, factored all that in already. So that's how some of these things work. Um, let me just see if there's one more thing before we open it up to the questions, uh, Andrew. Well, I've heard a lot of people ask, is it different this time? I hope I, maybe I've already answered this, but I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I described the three cases where we've had similar health events. I've described much worse historical events where more loss of life occurred, uh, more difficult recessions. Um, maybe we haven't had as many unemployed except for the depression, but we've filled the gap with providing um, trillions of dollars of uh, fiscal stimulus and uh, you know money from Congress, which is is going to help a lot of people get through the next couple of months. I think that you know there might be a couple more rounds if we do need to um, uh, you know stay at home and and not go out into uh, public uh, until we can get our arms around this. At least um, there might be more stimulus packages that need to come. I think the the governments of the world realize that the alternative is not something we want to ever go down through again, uh, the, depression era, the, the depression era of the 1930s. And we don't have to. Money is a man-made thing. It, it can be uh, distributed. It, are there consequences? Sure, there are. There's inflationary consequences. There are some things. But if everyone's doing it at the same time, then all fiat currencies are devaluing together. So the only thing that might uh, do better are non-fiat fiat currencies. Um, natural resources, precious metals, and things like that. Um, so maybe I open it up for some questions. Do you want to start, Andrew? Yeah, um, we'll kind of kind of go along those lines. Um, I think you've touched on this a little bit, but do you think there's any kind of consensus among the uh, Raymond Gaines economists that you're working with about when we'll find a bottom um, and kind of start to regain some of this lost value? Like, do we think it's years? Um, you know, what, do we, what, what kind of time frame do you think you're looking at? We're looking at um, for the uh, economic bottom, or maybe the stock market bottom. Did they specify? Uh, no specification, but I think probably both of them. I mean, economic in the larger sense of you know when when will things turn around? And then... well, I've sat on a ton of calls in the last couple of weeks with um, people that study viruses for a living, friends of mine, and doctors that I know that do that. And and you know, if we don't know how long this is going to last and until it kind of goes through our, our system, our cycle of, of uh, people on the earth, it's going to be hard to know how long the economic ramifications are going to be here. So, I mean, it's, I've seen people say three months and I've seen people say a year. Uh, so it's somewhere in between there probably. Um, if I was guessing it would be six to nine months for the, the recession, uh, uh, which would be half as long as uh, what we saw in 2008, 2009. So I think we can get through one of those. We might need um, more stimulus than we did. And, and actually to put it in perspective, the, the stimulus package that's been laid out already in just a matter of weeks is larger than the entire package of 2008 and nine. If you inflate that to today, in today's dollars, it's already greater. And this is basically the first round. I mean, it, there's been three phases, but the first three phases are significant and there's probably more to come. So I don't know if I can pin it down to, um, I think the market bottom was probably a couple weeks ago, like I just mentioned, the capitulation event. Sometimes the market in phase two goes through a testing period and you do need to kind of go back down to that point. And sometimes you even undercut the low. It's usually not significant uh, if it's a normal uh, recession. Um, and those happened during the last couple of pandemics that I mentioned too. Actually in 82, you never got a chance to buy that low again. Market right. took off, never went back. So that very well could have been the low already. Um, so how about if you have a kid going off to college in 18 months? <laughs> oh, well, hopefully that money isn't in the stock market, at least not 100% of it. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, that should be mostly in a age-based fund, um, a target date fund, and they, they are when they're managed by the center. Uh, <laughs> they're already about- I think we're covered, but I'm asking more generally. <laughs> yeah, uh, people should have yeah, target needs, really. I mean, you know, like I would say that kind of jokingly, 18 months for college, but 
you know, there are people who have things in, in short-term needs, even retirement-based stuff that, that might be more um, volatile. Yeah. An important thing I, I thought to mention is that everyone should always have, you know, their level of emergency funds available. So um, three to six months is a normal rule of thumb. If you don't have certain um, uh, coverages in place for like a disability insurance, then you probably need a longer time period of that. So we, we always recommend, you know, that type of safety net. And then for retirees, you should always have, you know, one year, maybe two years, everyone has different risk profile of cash need on hand in either very short term liquid um, uh, bond funds or money markets or in the bank, um, just so that you don't have to worry about what the long end of the bond market or the stock market's doing. And then you probably want to have five to seven years of uh, money in, that would come from bonds, either by them maturing uh, e equally each year or in providing coupons, and then some of that supplemented from dividend uh, income. So that way you don't have to worry about the stock market for five to seven years. I mean, it, the stock market shouldn't be assets that you're thinking of playing with under shorter periods of time, really. It's not the right way to look at, at those things. Um, do you have any idea how this situation will affect pensions from some of the large organizations in the area, like 4GM, pensions, Michigan Teachers Association, uh, different groups like that? Yeah. Well, there's nothing in the um, stimulus package yet. I, I've, I've talked to some people uh, this week who said there might be some of that coming in additional phases if necessary, because there, there are some plans around the country that are underfunded, but that's why plans, uh, pension plans pay into the PBGC, uh, the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. That way, if they do go under, that uh, the, the um, pensioners will receive still their pensions or some large portion thereof, uh, usually up to about $60,000. Um, white collar that earned and provide, get paid a lot more than that might see larger cuts, but the average worker would still get their, their pension if, if the uh, pension paid into the PBGC. And then states would also be another fallback plan. And that's why I think that uh, this fiscal stimulus is giving a lot of money to the states. It's, it's a significant, in the hundreds of billions already, and it'll probably be going up. All right, multitasking questions coming in right now. <laughs> um, so reading off from this question, I heard Nancy Pelosi talk about safeguards and oversight built into the stimulus package. And she said there'd be some items such as limits on executive compensation, but also on dividend distributions, and perhaps the government might become an equity owner in some of the companies. I was looking to use the pullback as an opportunity to purchase some dividend stocks with after-tax monies for income, as I'm semi-retired and most of the money that I will be drawing until I start Social Security is otherwise in a 401k. Is this a good idea at this time? And a little plug for CFP, does CFP have such a dividend portfolio? Sure, that's not hard to do. We, we do have some dividend focused portfolios, so uh, happy to help um, any way I can. But um, there has been a freeze on, on um, corporate executive payroll. I think it's 425,000 a year or no larger than the income packages they had last year, um, the, the lower of those two, if they're taking loans from the government. Uh, there's also no dividends and corporate buybacks if they're taking the loans or while the loans are outstanding. Um, so yes, Congress is going to be looking at that very closely for companies that take the, uh, the loans. Um, and, and government doesn't buy stocks. What, what they do is they, they provide um, backup plans, almost like loans, and then they become the owner of last resort. So for example, when General Motors went uh, down the tubes and, and the, the shareholders of that company lost everything, right? That they, they went to zero, government stepped in and bought up all the assets and bailed them out basically. And then eventually they were only an owner through the I, IPO, the secondary IPO, I should say, when they went public again. And the government just really sold their uh, their shares because they were the owners at the time of selling it back to the to the 
uh, country or to um, new new buyers, uh, that was that was really their only role. So they weren't in for the long haul. They were there just to kind of keep uh, the economy rolling ahead and not have millions of people displaced temporarily or for maybe even a year or two while uh, they put the pieces back together. They were just kind of helping General Motors get through, but not really wanting to be an owner of stocks. They don't buy stocks. They they really, even through this package, they're, they're going out in a limb by buying corporations of AAA high quality credit out five years. That's almost, I don't think that's ever happened before. Um, usually they only provide uh, support to treasury markets to make sure that the spreads are tight so buyers and sellers can be matched up easily and quickly. There was a, an event that happened during the capitulation period uh, a couple weeks ago where the spreads I don't think were ever wider in history of um, government bonds. So buyers and sellers were displaced. They couldn't come up with deals. So the government had to plug that hole and then they had to go into the other um, co commercial paper, corporate commercial paper markets and plug those holes because all there was was a tremendous amount of sellers and no buyers. Um, I saw someone today talking on a conference that municipal bonds and um, were, uh, it was between five and seven times uh, I'm probably going to goof this up. Let me see if I wrote any notes down. Yeah, the yields the yields blew out to five times what they were prior to March first. So if you if you had a tax free bond that maybe had a ten year maturity and it was paying you one percent, there was a point over the last two or three weeks where it paid five percent yield to maturity. <laughs> That's how crazy things got. I mean, they were at 1% for years. <laughs> and overnight, they went to five. Like, what happened? <laughs> That's because there was a run on money. There was a run on the banks. There was a run on anything that people could sell. And there was a market to sell it into. And basically, the government was the provider of last resort when there was no one there to buy. Crazy stuff. Yeah, everything keeps changing, right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, but like you said, it's not totally unprecedented. Um, so question on the tax um, stimulus package from the government. Um, if you know, will the $1,200 yeah, $1, that people will be receiving from the government be taxable? No, it's non-refundable tax credit. And there's phase out limits. I'm sure most people have seen them. Um, it's If you have income in 20, 18 or 2019, actually, if you had income of, if you're single, had income under 75,000 in 2018 and haven't filed your taxes in 2019, you'll get the check, $1,200 plus 500 for each child. If you have, and if you're married filing jointly, it's 150,000, you'll get the check. If you've made more than that, there's a phase out for uh, single people up to 99,000 and married filing jointly 146, 146,000. So that's when you do not receive the check. Now, if you filed 2019, they use that uh, income as your um, basis. And if you do not meet the requirements to receive a check in 2018 or 2019, and somehow you meet that for 2020, you can get that refundable tax credit when you do your taxes next year. And I'm told that over the next couple of weeks, the check will just be deposited in your bank if you have that set up to either pay your taxes electronically or receive refunds electronically in the past. If they've got a good bank that's been set up and being used and it still works, that's how they're going to send the money to you. So you kind of mentioned this, which was one of the follow-up questions I had with this. Um, so if you were employed and filed your taxes in 2018 and 19 and you would not have qualified, but you find yourself unemployed now, um, yeah. you would qualify, but you don't have a way to, you know, show that that becomes then a tax situation for your 2020 taxes that you file next year, but there's right. not a recourse for that right now. No, unfortunately, that's a, that's kind of a bummer is that if you do not uh, if you've made too much in 2018 and 2019, you have to wait till next year when you file your taxes, if you even um, would meet the requirements in 2020. 
Okay, so then it'll be based on whether you would meet the 2020 requirements also. Not yeah, it, you happen it, to be unemployed for you know, four months during COVID you know, time and then found a job it, and then the whole, whole tax year. Yeah, you only, you're only gonna get the check if for the whole tax year you are under the income limit threshold. All right. But it's not taxable. That answers the question that the person asked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I heard another point today, actually, that was interesting. Um, I think I've seen that before, but in terms of the payouts for that, you know, so it's 1200 per individual and then 500 for dependent, but it does not include dependents 17 and older. Correct. Is that correct? Yeah. 17 and older do not receive a check for $500. You have to be under 17 to get the check. Would they, well, does that have to be if they're a dependent on your tax forms or, you know, what if you've got someone who's, uh, I think I dated 18, you know, not claimed as a dependent, are they able to claim that as a 1200 on their own? Yeah. Then? If they're, dependent, yes. Yeah, that they're doing their own taxes. Um, so Following the questions here, numerous experts have posited that it will be 12 to 18 months before our new norm is realized. And, and this person agrees with that perspective. Um, if that's correct, what do you believe will be the most significant economic changes we should anticipate in the next 12 to 18 months? More Zoom meetings. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I'm not a futurist. Uh, I... <laughs> It's funny, we actually, I was in a circle like this talking about this and all of us were scratching our heads. I guess we're just that visionaries or something, but um, more online shopping, uh, technology, healthcare seem to be industries, industries that will thrive um, for a lot of reasons. Um, I think they're fairly straightforward. I mean, this is how we're communicating today is technology, otherwise uh, we wouldn't. Um, Do you think in a, in a more general sense, um, you see more growth in a lot of those areas or potential for growth in those areas? Like if you were going to look at, you know, where you'd want to invest time, effort, money, that sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, think about this. I have 30 people that I have sent home three weeks ago. We're all working from a different place than, well, most of us. I, I work from home a lot, but um, 27 of the 30 are, are probably hardly ever working at home very often they get I think they get one day a quarter that they could work from home um, is what the policy our, our work policy has been we, we do our best business I think together in the office um, for most teams and everything but our we have one on-site technology specialist and he's overwhelmed I mean he's dealing with 30 new environments that he's never had to deal with really so guess where we're investing money <laughs> in the uh, in energy. I mean, poor guy. He's, he's been working weekends. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he's working quite more than weekends too at that point. <laughs> um, so following along with this line of questions from the same, same person, um, you know, we've got an election coming up in November. Um, so if, if we kind of change the, the horse that we're on, um, and uh, move away from giving you know, money more towards big corporations and kind of I think the parallel of that is would be giving it more towards individuals. Uh, how do you believe that this will kind of change things economically? What would be different? Um, boy, that's, that's a loaded question. I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, Congress is really what you, you need to be worried about. They, you know, they handle the purse strings, right? And um, we've got, you know, a, a, a Democratic House and a Republican Senate that doesn't like to agree on much, but they did come together in a bipartisan manner and, and develop the fastest bailout or, or stimulus package in history. So they were able to come together in a time of crisis. That That's good. But um, I think the question has more to do with uh, what could change if we had maybe both the House and the Senate in in, in a democratic uh, format. Is that is that maybe what the person's asking? And that's not the question initially, but yeah, I mean, I think that that's a valuable way to look at it. Like you said, you know, Congress controls the first string, so. Um, 
you know, there is an opportunity that things change in, in that regard to um, this election cycle. Um, yeah, that's so, more important, I think. I mean, obviously the president has to sign, but the Congress writes the bills and they do need to be approved by the president, but that's who has to develop it. And I think that um, maybe we would get back to something closer to the 1950s, 60s, and uh, if it was more democratic, that that could be a possibility. But with that said, uh, did we get there a decade ago? You know, I mean, some good things happened uh, for everyday person, but um, we would really need to change our tax system, I think, in a, in a big way for that to have any real impact. Yeah. And, and go from, uh, you know, an, uh, maybe a more proportional tax system um, to progressive from regressive tax system, something like that, where in, in, the, in the 50s, the wealthy paid a lot more of their way. I mean, they paid a much larger percentage of their tax into the system and people were equalized more. I mean, we've, we've had the greatest level of disparity from rich to poor in the, in the last 100 years. I mean, there's never been a wider, at least the last 50, but you have to go back about 100 years when you saw um, the differential this great. And I mean, it's, it's sad. So maybe that could be fixed. Yeah. Not really my area, but. Um, the important thing is to get out and vote still, right? <laughs> um, I don't know how much we can dig into this one here, but I will bring it up. It's in relation to um, QCDs from the traditional IRA, so qualified charitable distributions from an IRA. Yeah. Um, this person has been doing taxes for uh, the past decade or so. Since QCDs became permanent, um, they've been using them, phenomenal tax savings, unless you need the money and can't afford charitable contributions. At this point, Fidelity says that the CARES Act passed on March 27th says we may waive our RMD for this year. Correct. You, you do not need to take an RMD um, for 2020. You still can do qualified charitable distributions, however, and that may make sense um, if you're not itemizing your uh, deductions because at least you're taking money out of a non-taxable, in a non-taxable way, out of a, a pre-tax account. So you're reducing that account for the future. Mm -hmm. um, so RMDs do not need to happen. And if you've already taken yours, um, we're helping some clients through this, because I have some clients that like their money in January, you know, first week. And um, now they realize they, you know, they might have taken something and increased their taxes to a point where they, they've, set themselves up for a larger uh, tax in into a larger tax bracket that now they realize they don't need to go into and they don't need the money. So um, normally you'd only be able to roll that back in if you um, did it within 60 days. But in 2020, the policy is that you can do it any time over the next three years, actually. Uh, you can roll that back in and, uh, and that take the 2020 required minimum distribution. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example. I have a client that um, he, he, his total tax is usually around 170. He's married filing jointly and he's always just going over the Medicare surtax by a couple thousand. And he's like, Matt, what can I do? You know, we, we had all these up years, we had capital gains. He was working a little bit still. He's in his, he's almost 80. And he still teaches and he does it for fun, just a small amount of income, but he has a huge pension from his um, previous career. Uh, but I told him, he said, said, now we can just put that back and you don't have to pay the Medicare surtax. So that he's really happy about that. Um, he was trying to do all these QCDs to limit his taxable income and, and now he can just put the RMD back. Yeah. Um. Getting into deficits and kind of in that vein of questions, um, we've, we've consistently been told that the economy was or is great, um, low unemployment, et cetera. However, the federal deficit for 2020 was forecast to reach 1.1 trillion, and that was kind of pre-COVID-19. 
Um, so the stimulus is going to add another two to three, four trillion to that. Um, mm. So deficits are supposed to be used for situations like this, not for great economy situations. With the deficit already so high, how concerned should we be about this ever increasing national debt? Mm. Seems like I get asked that question every time I speak somewhere. And I used to say it, it doesn't matter till it matters. And I don't know if that's just being a smart, trying to be a smart guy, but um, I, I think that luckily all, you know, not luckily, but all the countries in the world are doing some level of stimulus. So we're all kind of going down the same uh, road at the same time. But with that said, um, I mean, America was going into deficit during good times. That, that was concerning me. And I've been talking about that more than anything. The, the, this stimulus has to happen, but we shouldn't have been going into debt in the last year. That was ridiculous and silly uh, to be giving huge tax benefits and tax cuts to the wealthiest and, and large corporations. I mean, maybe it kept the economy running at a little bit better pace for a while, but that just seems silly. I mean, um, so what that does is it uh, reduces the value of your currency. Your fiat currency loses purchasing power. It's also, you know, thought of um, uh, as inflationary. But you know, we've just gone through 20 years where inflation has been 2.2 percent on average, which is one of the lowest inflationary periods in time. We've actually had some bouts of deflation during that time, but we've had tons of uh, money printing um, through the tech bubble bust bail us out there from those failures through uh, the, the credit crisis um, and, and now this package. So uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the debt is, is really, really high and the dollar is starting to show signs of weakening because of all this uh, printing of money. And it just, to me, it points to one direction. And I've only invested in gold one other time in 30 years. And I did pretty well on it for clients. We, we bought it, held it for five years and got out. It goes through um, cycles that are over the last couple hundred years, about 14 years in length. And we've just gone through a, a bear market for nine years. We were in a bull market for 12 years before that. So the last two cycles were a little, a little less than, um, than the average. But I think, I think precious metals and, and gold are starting to, to, show, to show up and say, look, we're here and we realize that, uh, that the countries of the world are printing money out of control. <laughs> and uh, we've been a store of value for thousands of years and I see the gold bugs showing up. So it's actually one of the things I was gonna leave people with is that that might be something to diversify as a hedge in your portfolio. If you've never used it before, start doing your research. And uh, I've studied it my whole career, and there are, like I said, only two times I've used it, and this is one of them. Uh, good advice. Um, so we've got about a um, little over 10 minutes left. I've got one question left. If anyone's got anything more they'd like to ask, um, I've gotten several of them over my email. I think that went around in the, uh, the email invite that came up from Sarah, if you want to send that way, um, or you can drop it in the chat underneath. Um, so this is kind of a follow-up to um, how we opened with this. Um, I'm sure we're going to see, or continue to see millions of more layoffs in companies doing poorly. Um, how is it that we can be at the bottom of the stock market right now? How, how can we not be at the bottom of the stock how, market? How is it that you're looking at this as we're kind of at the bottom of the market, even though um, you know a lot of the estimations are we're going to see millions more layoffs than companies doing poorly? Yeah, basically just goes back to the market being, you know, forward looking. It's already discounted all of these things. It already realizes that this, these types of things are going to happen. If the stock market goes to new lower lows, then it's figuring out something we don't, you know, really know right now today. And uh, some, some really bad news about maybe that there's no chance for a cure for a year or longer. Um, or we're gonna to have to go through many levels and cycles of this. It, let's say it came back through Asia again. And you know, the, the pandemic of 20 or 1918 
actually came around twice in two different seasons. And the second one was much more brutal than the first one, killed many millions of more people. So that could be something that we don't know yet that the market hasn't quite figured out. Uh, and I don't know that I'm, I'm smart enough to, to see that, but usually the, the, this cycle right now looks like that was the low and, and uh, for what we know, you know, going out six to nine months, the market is trying to say that was the bottom and, and now we're in the second phase of this cycle and we have to see if we test those lows. I, I think there's a good chance of that. So the market's run up 22% from the bottom on March 16th, but there's a real good chance we go right back down there before um, we, we get out of phase two. With phase three, then you break out of the pattern in phase two and you go to newer highs that you didn't reach through this two to five month period that we're kind of in right now, vacillating in. Um, and that's how most cycles are. I mean, that's all you can go by. I have 12 cycles to study. It's not like we have uh, a lot of data sample sets here. We got 12. <laughs> so that's what I have to work with. But I'll, I'll make another really important point. There's something I said in 2009 that I, I'm not saying here. That was a, a generational low, probably a low that you'll never see again in your lifetime to buy. In terms of valuations, stocks were never that cheap in my lifetime. And that's not where we're at right now. So when price to earnings ratios and price to sales and price to book, you see all these things, they're at averages. They're at the 25 year average right now. So things aren't cheap. In 2009, they were 50% below average. So we're nowhere near a cheap market. So that does tell me that maybe the market hasn't figured all this out yet. If this thing goes a lot longer um, or it has another phase or round, the market could be wrong about March 16th. Okay. Um, that, oh, one more question coming in here. Oh, the head, chat box was disabled. I apologize for that. That is um, something I didn't even consider to look at. <laughs> here we go. Um, I just opened that back up. If anyone has any last minute questions, Matt, I don't know if you've got anything you want to say as kind of a closer. We're, we've got a, just under 10 minutes here. Um, no, I, I hope this has been helpful. Um, I'm, I'm always here. I, I've sat on the committee with uh, the endowment committee for 20 years and tried to provide some guidance, but you know, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun working with those folks and, and helping the endowment grow. Uh, we're always looking for new people to join. So if anyone's on this call wants to talk to uh, Rich Shrek, uh, give him a call. I'm sure we're always looking for people to join in future years. Um, He's a good guy. I like him. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, hopefully this helped. I, I think that I'll leave you with one thing. I, I believe that I made it clear that this might be a time to hedge and own gold to, to make sure that you've got an emergency capital at all times and to have a couple of years, um, especially if you're retired of cash flow and very conservative bonds and cash, uh, five to seven years of bonds for um, not having to worry about what stocks do through this phase. Because even if they do break the March 16 low, um, you know they'll, they'll go down a couple thousand more points, probably to 15,000 or something. It'll scare the heck out of everybody, but it's not the end of the world. We'll get to those you know, close to 2009 uh, count levels and, and valuation, but it still won't be as cheap as that. And we will get through this, you know, and the Fed will probably continue to do stimulus rounds every time it, it gets scary. So um, that's the great thing is that I think we, we realize now the governments of the world that we don't have to go into a depression. There is other options. So I, I think that, that that will be skirted around and uh, we'll get through this okay. It's just going to be difficult on us living at home and doing things so differently for many months i think ahead of us yeah uh one more that just came through the chat um should we continue to rebalance our portfolio through this great question tough this is what we get paid to do <laughs> uh, i've been i've been having more personal conversations with clients about that uh because i think that you know some people are are very terrified and scared of what's going on so instead of me just doing it like I normally would with a pullback like this. I've been reaching out to clients and say, how do you feel? And as long as they're not distraught or despondent, 
I'm recommending that they do it. Now, that doesn't mean that this is the last time we'll rebalance. In 2008 and 9, if we would have rebalanced every time we were supposed to, there would have been two or possibly three rebalances, depending on how aggressively the client was. And I'll tell you, there's not many people that went back to the well for that third rebalance. They, they were devastated. And there were great fund companies, like I'll, I'll name American Funds, who's one that does that. They stuck to their guns. They had the best 10 year track record of almost any mutual fund company. So over the next bull market, you're gonna make out like bandits, but doing it while it needs to be done, it's tough stuff. That's that is about as hard as this job gets, is to to take your client, you know, by the hand and say, Okay, I know you just got your arm cut off, but we have to buy more stocks and then you know this might happen again, you get your leg cut off. <laughs> it's it's not that fun stuff to be doing in times like this, but that's how you you do really well in returns over time. Great. <laughs> Terrible analogies. Yeah. <laughs> Monty Python-esque, you know, it's just a flesh move, right? <laughs> yeah, that's how it feels though. Yeah. Um, well, I really appreciate your time tonight, Matt. Um, I think if people still have questions following this, um, they can either get a hold of, you know, you directly or still send them to me and I, I know how to get a hold of you and can pass them along. Um, I think that we made a recording of this and it's going to be shared up on, uh, I believe, the Facebook page as well. Um, wow. So if anyone you know um, wasn't able to join tonight, I know there's some folks who are looking forward to seeing the video later um, and we might see some additional questions come through from that. Um, but once again, thanks so much for your time, Matt. Really appreciate the insight and the expertise on this and um, hope everyone stays well and keep washing their hands. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Good night. Have a good night, everyone. Take care.